First one up here, Tom Lee. We're gonna watch this one, react to this one here. Tom Lee talked about some stocks that are some big opportunities, things like that. And uh, warning, it's gonna look like he's on a roller coaster ride with a green screen. So get ready to get ready to be very entertained in that one, okay? Let's get into this. In the S&P 500 and NASDAQ lower for a third straight day, our next guest still sees a strong case to buy the dip. Let's bring in fun strats, Tom Lee. Tom, uh, it's good to catch up with you here. Uh, obviously, he is. He's on a roller it's coaster a bull ride. market. Buying the dips generally tends to make sense. It's certainly been rewarded uh, in the last several months. But it's almost like we haven't hardly had much of a dip to, to, to speak of. You know, you had these little wobbles lower, another wobble one, uh, right now. Are you confident that they're going to stay so shallow? Uh, that's a great question, Michael. I think one of the reasons these dips have been shallow is that measures of investor leverage, whether it's margin debt, uh, which is still below July 2023 levels, or cash on the sidelines, which hit a record 6.1 trillion last week, or this past week, uh, shows you that investors are still uncomfortably underinvested, and therefore these dips are opportunities to add. I've been traveling in Latin America for the past week, meeting with a lot of pension funds, and we're getting the sense that these investors are waiting for a dip. So as soon as you get some sort of wobble like today, I, I think these are quickly met by buying. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly been the case, although how do you... I guess, uh, jive that. So yeah, we have a ridiculous amount of cash on the sideline right now. And, you know, how should you view that, right? You know, all time record, by far and away a record amount of money just chilling over there, earning really nice interest right now. How should you view that as an investor? Okay, two things. First, realize that most of that money, the far majority of that money is going to stay over there. Okay, that's not going to come into the market. It's not like 6.1. We're probably growing to 6.2, 6.3 trillion dollars. Probably going to, who knows where we go. Maybe we go to 7 trillion plus, right? Keep in mind, all that money's not going to end up back in the stock market. There will be a portion that if you get a big enough dip in the market, you'll get a portion over. And then on top of that, if interest rates go lower, right? Um, that's going to be a potential where people say, okay, I can't earn as much over here. I got to put my money in the stock market. Now, the second way you should also view that is you should have some money on the sideline as well. I, you know, I, I think to be a hundred percent invested all the time is a little dangerous. I like to keep some cash around. You should always have an emergency fund, right? You should always have some money that's just over there, make you sleep well at night. You know, it's easy to access that if the market goes down or anything like that. Cause the last thing you want to be ever in is a cash strap situation, right? Where all of a sudden, let's say the, the market tanks and then you need cash for something. You got to sell your stocks at a bad price, right? You don't ever want to be in that situation. So that's just a little food for thought in regards to that. And uh, this is like when, you know, you got a, you got an interview at one o'clock, but you also got your kids you're taking them to Disneyland. He's Tom Lee's on the little cup ride right now. With the fact that you've seen some of the other indicators of positioning and investor sentiment, whether it's investment advisors or retail investors uh, or call option volumes, seeming like at least uh, things have gotten a little bit extended. Or you could be on a tractor ride as well, right? Uh, you know, to an extent those are extended because, you know, prime brokerage data really tends to capture the TMT uh, hedge fund positioning, which mm. does look extended. And AAII uh, tends to reflect bullish sentiment, but it doesn't necessarily reflect actual positioning which you know, we can tell by margin debt still quite low. And other measures don't necessarily capture what private bank and wealthy individuals and households are doing, which you know, when, you, when we hear from our wealth managers, still have a very conservative bias for their clients. So mm -hmm. I think that we're not, in, we're not really as exhausted in terms of positioning or even sentiment as we were in October 2021. Now, I know, Tom, that you feel as if uh, there's a potentially long-lasting outperformance cycle possible in smaller uh, stocks. Um, been a lot of false starts in this direction. Uh, been some pressure That's on true. the Russell 2000 and That's other uh, small cap measures with rates going higher. Uh, what sets the scene for you to say that small caps will start to work on a relative basis? Uh, well, it is a constellation of factors, Michael, that are really coming together for the first time. Uh, we're emerging from a, a pretty terrible inflation cycle that was, you know, crushing for smaller companies, especially their ability to uh, raise prices relative to larger companies. And it's coming at a time when the Fed is about to make a pretty abrupt move to being supportive of the business cycle instead of fighting inflation. And on a valuation side, small caps are trading at 44% of the price to book of large caps. 
That's exactly where we were in 1999, and that was the launch point for 12 years of outperformance. So I think when investors start to allocate the stocks and the Fed starts to be visibly cutting, you know, I think the Fed is not clear when they start. Well, he talks about 12 years of outperformance, so that would run through to, uh, what, 2011, right? But I think that's not the best viewpoint, and let me, let me explain why, okay? Listen, listen. 1999, we know what happened right after 1999, right? The, the tech bubble went pop, and a lot of big companies got hurt. And then we know what also happened in 08, 09. You then had a cycle of, obviously, uh, the big dog stocks getting absolutely wrecked in the great financial crisis, right? And small caps did too. But then small caps started to roll out of that. So I don't look at that as the best kind of gauge, unless you're expecting two major downfalls for the market in a matter of the next 12 year span or something like that, okay? So that's just a little food for thought in regards to that. There's ways out, the Russell can outperform the market without having to go through a great financial crisis and then a tech bubble <laughs> crash, because that, that was a whole situation there. So that's the only thing I would push back on a little bit in regards to that. But when they start, I think it's gonna be a big tailwind for small caps. Now, you know, the um, relative valuation you mentioned going back to 1999 or thereabouts uh, absolutely seems to be the case. The, the length of underperformance has been something similar. But if I look back at that period, you know, after 2000, the peak in the market, a lot of that outperformance by small caps came because large cap growth just imploded. Yep. I mean, you did, just did see devastation in some of the largest stocks. Now, obviously, small caps held And it up. wasn't just once. It was twice. It was tech bubble, and then it was great financial crisis, right? Just they were about eight years apart. And then went up uh, after the, the market low in the early 2000s. But I assume you're not suggesting that that's what we're in for. Uh, that's right. I think one of the differences, principal difference, is that uh, it's the starting point. You know, the S&P large cap is roughly 15 times X the mag seven. The Russell 2000, if you look at the profitable companies there, have multiples more like 12 times. And the non-profitable small caps in the Russell actually have leverage either to economic growth or to risk premium declines. Mm -hmm. So you have like sort of the double recipe within the small cap index of quality companies having multiple expansion but also sort of risk appetite growing and allows, you know, whether it's the biotechs or some of the regional banks, which will have future growth, but actually don't really earn money right now. All right. Yeah, we'll see if uh, if all that can uh, can coalesce. Tom, appreciate the time today. Thank you. So in my opinion, before we get in this recession video, in terms of thinking about the Russell booming, right? Uh, and I know a lot of people are convinced and maybe even Tom Lee that when the time comes and the Fed starts cutting rates, that Russell stocks are going to Boom, like, you know, massive outperformance. They're just going to tear it up, right? Next thing you know, Russell's going to be 2,500, maybe even 3,000, something like that, okay? Listen, it's very important to understand this. If the Federal Reserve is lowering because inflation's come down so much that they're happy with where inflation's at, okay, I can see that potentially playing out. But if the Federal Reserve is lowering and lowering because the economy is getting far worse and unemployment skyrocketing or something like that, that's not going to be bullish for the Russell. That's going to be very bearish for the Russell, okay? Because obviously, you know, I mean, you go look at the great financial crisis, look how the Russell performed in that. It wasn't good, okay? So the moral of the story is if the Fed, if we actually get a soft landing, yeah, 100%, Russell's going to boom. It's going to way outperform the other indexes by a large margin. But, but if the Fed's lowering because the economy's getting weak, I'm telling you, that's not going to be a boom for the Russell. So it's just something to kind of take into account there, okay? We got to be, you know, not super confident. Be a little cautiously optimistic, I guess you can say that, okay? There's really no need for the Fed to lower interest rates. I'm looking forward to getting into that one. Uh, Ed, about whether we do There's get a lot of ways this year. A lot of ways. You were on, I think, about two weeks ago. And I think at that point... You, you weren't completely sure either about how many or when right. they come. It, 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 we've seen a couple of inflation data points since then. What, what's your latest uh, on that? We see something in June or July yeah. or June or July? Yeah, I've, yeah, Joe, I've been in the uh, fewer and later camp on the federal funds rate cutting. Um, I never really understood at the beginning of the year why the market seemed to be thinking five, six, seven cuts. I was thinking that uh, we should just stick with what... Fed officials were talking about, which was two to three. Uh, but over the past few weeks, I've had my 
my doubts about two to three, not just uh, this past week when we saw hotter than expected inflation. It's just the economy is doing quite well and inflation, I think, is still moderating. So uh, my mantra is why mess with success? Uh, there's really no need for the Fed to, to, to lower interest rates. So I, I think uh, Fed Chair Powell and, and his one day, Wednesday presser is going to be a, a, a touch more uh, hawkish than he had been recently, uh, for example, at congressional testimony. Where's the strength in the economy coming from, Ed? It, and it, it yes. was somewhat unexpected. And where are there beginning. That is why I love reacting to some of these videos because, man, what a difference between these two videos, right? This other gentleman, very, very bearish. Recession. I mean, the way he's talking is basically like the Fed should be cutting right now aggressively, right? You got an Ed Yardini here who, who, you know, sounds like it's all palm trees and cool breezes going on. And then he's making a case that there's no need for the Fed to cut. It's some signs of some weakness. Well, I think uh, the main focus uh, always has to be on the consumer. Consumers account for 70, 75 percent of uh, the economy's activities. And I think that's where we've seen the strength. And uh, clearly, a lot of that has to do with the labor markets. Uh, you, know, you don't get a recession when uh, employment's at an all-time record high. You don't get a recession when within that you've got construction employment at an all-time record high, health care employment at an all-time record hard and high, and so on and so forth. There's, there's a lot of strength in the labor market, and we keep... The two things that are helping out the labor market in a massive, epic way. Two things specific, okay? First one. Government spending, my gosh. I mean, you know, obviously the big infrastructure plan went through a while back and that's gone, that that money's been funneled out to states and to the federal government and just, you know, a lot of money in terms of construction, infrastructure projects, those sorts of things, okay? Second thing that has helped us out tremendously is what I spoke about earlier, home building. Home building's been phenomenal. I tell you guys, like, the best thing to ever happen in the U.S. economy is a new home is built. Is the best freaking thing. The best thing. It creates so many jobs. It's ridiculous. When you think about how many people are employed based upon building a home, it's ridiculous how many different companies and trades make money off of a new home being built, right? And obviously, there's, it's just ridiculous. And so that's another factor that has helped us out tremendously is the fact that home building has stayed very, very strong. And so... Until those two things break, it's going to be hard to really damage the employment market in any substantial way. You need home building to, to take a step back, or you need the federal government to basically not keep pumping money out there. And I, I don't know, you know, as of right now, at least those two things look pretty decent. Maybe a few years from now, it's a different situation, but for right now, it looks decent, right? You can go those initial unemployment claims every Thursday, and they just continue to hover just north of 200,000, which uh, is consistent with an unemployment rate below 4%. So I think that's where it is first and foremost. And, uh, and here's the thing, you know, obviously we're about to go into a presidential cycle, right? That election's what, six months away now or whatever. Okay, if, if B-Man gets in again, you, you think he's gonna stop the spending? No, he's gonna be spending like crazy. T-Man gets in? You think T-Man's gonna stop spending? I got a bridge to sell you if you think that's going to happen. You think T-Man wants a big recession on his watch? Oh, heck no. So the bottom line is, regardless if it's B-Man or T-Man, both are going to be spending money. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about commercial real estate. And uh, that could present itself over the next couple of years because as things get refinanced. Uh, but even there, there's some signs that it's just not just across the board weakness. Uh, there are some areas of strength. Uh, w within that so and and even real uh, commercial real estate prices may be starting to bottom so it doesn't look all that bad is any of this residual stimulus or or fiscal spending or or the fed's mm -hmm. balance sheet any of the things that that, that we've talked about uh, in the past ever since the congress ever since congress flipped there hasn't been any new legislation has there been anything i don't i mean barely can uh, yeah. can keep the government open but is this chips act uh, Inflation Reduction Act, infrastructure, is any of that playing into this? Absolutely, um, because that's another area of strength is capital spending and public spending. We have seen a, a tremendous amount of uh, onshoring activity, which we've seen in manufacturing facilities production. Uh, so that's uh, been strong. I think it remains strong. Uh, and then once they finish uh, building the facilities, they're going to have to 
put in a lot of equipment, robotics, automation, and even labor. So I, I think that's an yeah. I mean, you, you know, go see that TSMC facility in Arizona and check out that job site. And you know, as a project that's been you know going on for a couple of years now at this point in time, and it's still going on. And check out how many people are working on that project. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like so many cars have to park for construction workers in that area. You think there's a football game going on, like an NFL game or something like that. Go to the east side. Look at some of those Intel projects that are going on. It's ridiculous. I mean, those sorts of projects, whew, they don't create small amounts of jobs. It's ridiculous sums of jobs for projects like that. Of strength. And then once those facilities are done, there's a lot of highly skilled labor that needs to go into those those um, you know facilities, right? Public infrastructure. There's still a lot of money being committed to uh, roads and bridges and so on, and that that uh, mm -hmm. is likely to continue. So yeah, that's that stimulus is still there. And and by the way, uh, while we're all looking at the government's outlays on interest income going up and worrying about it. In the short term, it is an outlay and it is stimulative. There's a lot of people yep. uh, who live on fixed income um, assets and they are actually doing extremely well without That's taking true. a lot of risk uh, by keeping their money in money market funds or even some deposits that are paying more. Yep. I guess the infrastructure bill was that bipartisan money just and the building, CHIPS Act was building, bipartisan. Building. The IRA yeah. was not, but uh, it just present a problem for Republicans that to, who have... Uh, you know, criticized all that spending. So are, are, in your view, it's working mm -hmm. at this point? And I mean, we do have a big, yeah. we, we have $34 trillion to worry about in terms of, right. of, of well, all well, the that, debt we've built up. But is it working near term? Why don't we do more of it then? And that, that seems yeah. like a terrible lesson that we're learning. Yeah, I, I mean, that's uh, so-called modern monetary theory uh, idea. MMT, that, baby. Uh, the government can Monopoly spend money. Uh, w without limit because uh, it's it, new. Uh, prints We've its own money and, uh, and, 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 and lots of people overseas in, in the United States uh, are willing to finance the, the, the deficit. No, I think it... Listen, listen. Everybody acts like MMT is like some new thing. Like, you know, like everybody just learned about it, I guess, in, in the past few years. MMT, like modern monetary theory, we've been doing this for like oh my gosh, like 100 years in the United States. Like literally look back at throughout history. <laughs> like we've been doing this for a long time. This is nothing new. We've been spending a lot more than what we really got coming in decade after decade for a long time now at this point in time. And so this is nothing new. You could say maybe it's more aggressive than it was in the past. Fair play. But we've been doing this for a long time. All the way back to WW2, we've been doing this. Actually, probably WW1, thinking about it now at this point in time, right? So this is nothing new to us. We've been doing this. I think it's just everybody finally learned about what MMT was, I guess. Dangerous road to go down. Uh, I think we've gone... Or maybe politicians in the past did a better job of selling it to the public without people really, like, Googling the data. Maybe that helped. Like, people can actually see the data nowadays and be like, wait a minute, we're running deficits? Wait a minute, look at all this debt? Wait, we're, we're, we're buying stuff? We're creating jobs that really we can't pay for? Oh, what? Quite a bit uh, in, in that regard. Uh, the, the main problem uh, clearly is at some point the bond market might very well care about uh, all the supply of securities. It gave us a hint of that. Do you remember, Joe, uh, last summer, August, September, October, we saw the bond yields soar from four and a quarter percent to five percent. Uh, so, you know, my, my friends, the bond vigilantes seem to have gone into a little siesta mode here, but they are starting to wake up a little bit. I mean, 4.3 percent. On the on the ten year, if, you know that's the risk. If we get a situation where people worry about inflation again in the bond, if they worry about it in the bond market uh, again, uh, and they decide that the auctions are too large, then we'll have a problem again. All with with possible rate cuts coming, which doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, the, you can't have a situation where the 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 Fed goes from. You know, we're stepping on the brakes, not uh, pat, you know, tapping on the brakes, but slamming on the brakes to suddenly stepping on the accelerator uh, and then uh, combine that with ongoing fiscal stimulus so that the fiscal authorities are stepping on the accelerator. That's not a healthy thing. That's why I'm not rooting for rate cuts. I think the economy is doing just fine with this level of interest rates. Leave it alone. Yeah, you got the federal government spending like crazy, right? And then you got this situation where the Fed's trying to fight it off. Woo! That's a challenge, okay? Glad I don't have Jerome Powell's job. Appreciate y'all joining me. Thanks so much for being here as always. If you haven't got a chance to get my new free workshop, check out the pinned comment down there. It's absolutely free to access that. How much money do you need to retire 
focus full time on investing, all those subjects we cover in that one here today. Okay, much love and have a great day.